Hi folks, welcome to what might be one of the coolest projects we have ever made, machining and injection mold. Let's talk about where we bought the mold, why we're doing this, how we're doing this, the CAD, the CAM. There are some pretty tight tolerances and some pretty deep holes and some pretty small intricate work that's gotta happen and we've gotta have all of our tooling and our machining recipes dialed in to get good results. And then we're gonna pack this off, send it out to Utah where the press is, and we'll see what the product looks like. Let's dive in. So what is this? It's a series of plates that form a die set and we're going to be pushing plastic, or in our case rubber, through the machine into this die set at a very high pressure. It's going to cause that plastic to flow into the part that we machine to end up with a product, a product that we can produce very inexpensively in very high quantities. Injection molding machines can run quite some time without humans having to touch the parts, and that's how you keep the volume high and the price per part very low. It is not an exaggeration to say that most of modern society is fueled by products that are injection molded. Everything from your favorite Lego set to most of the household appliances in your kitchen to the soles on the sneakers or the shoes you're wearing right now most likely came out of injection molds which had to be machined by CNC machines. I had always heard that injection molds were exorbitantly expensive, you know, way out of our reach, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I think that may still be true for really complex shapes, large shapes, higher tolerance, or even higher volume production run parts. This wasn't that expensive for what we're able to do with it. We purchased a DME Express mold base. So these are sort of turnkey in stock, ready to go. So we're not creating a base from scratch, but we're rather using one that's off the shelf. And it arrived on a freight pallet. And then it's up to us to, number one, machine in the actual cavities that we want for our product to be injection molded, machine some clearance holes, machine some very reamed, very precise holes for ejector pins. And we've got to machine some pretty deep through coolant lines with some NPT taps to run coolant hoses through the die set. We're gonna start off with this purplish blue plate right here, which is where all the action happens. We've got these two cavities to machine, left and right, which will form the majority of our part, as well as this area in the center. Our Haas is a VM3, M stands for mold machine. And I would argue there's two things on this machine that make it what you would call a mold machine. Number one, the table has those X and Y cross slats. That makes it really easy to hold down large molds. There happen to be a lot of auto industry molds that are designed for this 26 inch table Y travel. The other thing is we have a higher pitch screws on our X, Y, and Z axis, it just simply means for every rotation of our axis servo, the machine moves a little bit less, which means you have theoretical and practical increased resolution of precision and accuracy. It's also a really heavy machine. It's about 16,000 pounds. We've been super happy with the finishes and accuracy we've gotten on it as we've made our Saunders Machine Works fixture plates. Ironically, now, after having machine for the first two years, we're making a proper mold with it. Card here to the video that talks more about why we bought this machine and the process and the ROI and the math behind it. I'm sweeping across our jaw face to make sure that the orange vise is trimmed in, but we had a minor chip which was giving us about a six, ten thousandths of an inch dip in the jaw. Took that off, cleaned it off, re-secured the jaw in place, and I eliminated any measurable run out. Setting up our tools, we wanted to get this right on the first try. We called up Harvey and actually used their phone tech support to pick some of the correct end mills, surfacing end mills, and reamers for this project, and we want to emphasize checking tool run out using high quality holders and ER collets, and you want to use an on size ER collet. So if we have a 1 8 inch shanked tool, I want to use a 1 8 inch ER collet. I don't want to use a larger collet that can squeeze down to that size. You'll get better concentricity and better gripping power with the closer, tighter fitting collet. Checking run out, anything under two ten thousandths of an inch, I don't worry about. But if it's more than that, three, four, especially five tenths, I will take a flat bladed screwdriver with a piece of rubber tape on the end to prevent metal on metal contact and I'll start to tap that tool in or dial it in. You can also remove the tool or the collet or the whole holder and try a combination of rotating them to minimize or reduce that run out.
really taking our time here using a torque wrench to apply consistent clamping pressure even though this is a really thick strong mold base and that's probably overkill and then using the dial indicator to double check all of my work make sure we're lined up in x y and z For the drilling, we are using 135 degree point angle cobalt drills from McMaster Card. <laughs> drills are amazing. Card here to the Wednesday widget we did talking about just how awesome twist drills are for removing material and they're so inexpensive. These cobalt drills did excellent on the semi-hardened tool steel. Much of the rest of this video, you'll see us alternating between having coolant on and off. It's great to have it off for the camera so you can see what's going on. And there is a ton to be said for cutting steel dry. We're working on it, but we will still use coolant throughout a lot of this video, partly just to help evacuate chips to ensure we're not recutting and double cutting chips. That can increase your chip load. It can chip the end mill and it will almost certainly ruin surface finishes. And we want spectacular finishes for this mold. One of the keys to getting a really good reamed hole, and by that I mean a good finish, a good tolerance, and good concentricity, is not just the reamer itself, but how good and consistent the pre-reamed hole is. Fun fact, as awesome as drills are, they actually tend to not drill round holes. They tend to dr drill holes that are slightly triangulated. And one of the things I wanted to check was to make sure we had a really tight, really consistent pre-ream diameter when we go to stick that Harvey reamer in there. So an easy thing to do is we grabbed a duplicate drill and we quickly checked both the tip and the shank of that drill to see how it fit inside our hole. Fit was great. That also tells us we've got our speeds and feeds dialed in. Now we're doing the roughing and the finishing toolpath strategies for this injection mold. And I have to say how amazing the Fusion 360 cam is. We take this for granted. When I got started 10 years ago, it was hard to find good cam software or it was incredibly expensive. And the three axis, four axis, and even five axis toolpaths out of Fusion 360 are just awesome. And I know I'm spoiling this video, but the mold turned out spectacular. And a lot of it has to do with the fact of, in this case, finishing that mold with this scallop toolpath to give us uh, just a beautiful, really good surface finish. Monitoring the spindle load, it's just three or four percent, making sure it doesn't jump out of the way. Monitoring your spindle load can be really helpful. Sometimes it's not just the nominal value, say 10% spindle load or 20% spindle load, but on things like drilling, if you see that spindle load spike up, that means you're not evacuating chips and it's very likely that you could break that tool or break that drill. So keep your eye on that, especially on deep holes. See that spot? For those of you that follow us on social media, you knew that we crashed the Haas uh, on this project. And this operation is when we did that. I forgot to measure the reamer height. I've been so focused on run out, just my fault. Um, but card here to our new bloopers video where you can see that crash happen. We're using the Fusion 360 reaming drill operation. So under drilling, it's still a drill. On the cycle tab, the cycle type we have selected as reaming. And you can see this descriptive pop-up comparing all these different options. The big difference with reaming is it does not wrap it out of the hole, it feeds out. And again, how you exit a reamed hole, both the feed rate and the spindle can very much affect the quality, concentricity, and surface finish.
now we're roughing and then finish machining this center slot here. So this is where the plastic first flows into and then it goes either left or right and it makes its way into our actual product via these submarine ports right here. So one of the critical tolerances which we'll see later in the video is how we machine these ports because the diameter of this hole needs to be very, very accurate and this identical to the diameter of that hole. That way the plastic flows into each of our parts evenly. After I had successfully machined the majority of this plate, I realized we were going to be able to salvage it. So then, we're just coming back in and using the end mill as a magic eraser to machine away that mistake and just dropping that plane a few thousandths of an inch below the rest of that surface. That way it doesn't interfere when these two faces come together in the mold. I stared at this for about 10 minutes trying to think of how I was going to hold this relatively large mold base on our Haas Trunnion fifth axis and then it occurred to me, let's just use one of the Tormach vices. It's their four inch vise and it fit perfectly and it opened up wide enough to hold the part. I just had to remember not to rotate my C axis. Again, being very methodical, sweeping all the surfaces to make sure our alignment is dialed in. So to cut these submarine ports, I've got to rotate the part in the fifth axis. Then we're using a very long gauge length Mari Tool ER32 holder with enough tool stick out to reach that tool all the way down into this cavity. This doesn't look as scary on video as it did in person, but rest assured, pucker level was 10.0 full clench mode when this platter rotated into position and the spindle and tool came down. Next up, same Cobalt series of drills from the Faster Car. They're actually Precision Twist, really good brand. And we've got to drill these 7 16 holes. We're going to drill them half from each side. So we'll drill half, flip the part over, drill the other half. And these are water cooling lines. One of the tricks of injection molding is keeping the mold temperature constant and preventing it from rising as the hot plastic flows through over time. And cooling lines with coolant are the trick to doing that. We then interpolated out the NPT and then thread milled that NPT to size. Yes, you can thread mill NPTs in Fusion 360. Why is it that even if you've been thread milling for years, it is still horrifyingly scary when it first starts? Thank you. 
shout out to Orange Vice. We've used their 20 inch full cast iron versions on our VM3 for quite some time. They've come out with a new 17 and a half inch single station vice, but it's your traditional six inch size. And with aluminum carriers, at least for the introductory price of $699, it looks great, and I love the fact that the carriers will support traditional bolt-on style jaws, hard or soft, carve smarts, and they've got built-in talon rails. That is awesome. After that, we had a number of other plates where we had to either drill or drill and ream a number of holes for the ejector pins and the guide pins and the bushings. But the only other critical machine that we had to do was the top of our injection mold part. So the plate that sandwiches up against this purple plate in our Fusion model, that's this bright green plate. And it has two key things on it. It has our logo so that you can ever so subtly see the Saunders Machine Works logo on the finished product. And it has this reamed hole here. And this reamed hole lets us use a replaceable or changeable pin, and we can grind the tip of that pin as we see fit. And the key here was to create some geometry at the very center of our fixture plate plug that allows us to stab them with a scribe or another sharp tool to remove the plug. Other than that, it was a relatively simple and straightforward project. We were really concerned about not only the individual tolerances in the surface finishes, but also the stacked tolerances. All of these parts have to fit together, and most of the outside features were already done with the ready-made die set, but we still had to drill and ream the holes for the ejector pins so that the alignment was almost perfect throughout this whole model, or else it wouldn't fit together, or if we really had more than even a thousandth of an inch total slop on the ejector pins, some of that plastic might flash or flow out through the mold and it would make it either not work or just be a really bad mold. When we were done, we packaged it up, we shipped it out to Utah and a big shout out to Jonathan. He's the fellow helping us on this. He's done a, a lot to pay it forward in, in terms of teaching and training folks on injection molding. He's got a press and he's helping run these parts. We ran the first batch and they worked out great. They look great, the mold is running great, the fit is great, and it was a real win. One of my proudest moments as a self-taught machinist to go from running a benchtop tag in my New York City apartment to now being able to say that we actually made a functional injection mold. Definitely had some help along the way, but it's nevertheless super fun and exciting. Makes me want to do more. Folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.